Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares, a weekly webcast series addressing a wide variety of topics to support family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver who became a certified Alzheimer care consultant and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading health healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Fried, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, and I'd like to submit, give my sincere thanks to the Zeller Family Foundation for to making today's webcast possible. So today we will be discussing the relationship between concussions and neurocognitive disorders. My guest is Dr. Alain Petito, Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill University and Director of the Psychology Department at the McGill University Health Center. His research involves the investigation of the mechanisms involved in cerebral reorganization and plasticity in various patient populations. In recent years, Dr. Petito has explored new methods of using functional MRI for examining brain trauma. Dr. Petito will address how brain injuries change the brain, the relationship between concussions and dementia, and potential treatments to restore brain health after a concussion. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Claire. Thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> so I'm very, very uh, much looking forward to this webcast that is going to be extremely educational to so many people, including parents who have children playing a lot of sports today. So um, normally I ask a whole bunch of questions during my interviews, but not today. Today we're going to start off with a extremely um, powerful video that Dr. Petito is going to show us, and then he's going to take it away with a full presentation on concussions. So I hand it off to you. Thank you. So let me click on this share screen to see hopefully that, that will work. So here is the clip I'm going to show you, and I'll comment as we go. So these are examples of, uh, uh, of uh, concussions. That, are, that happen in sports and in, in, you know, in, in motor vehicle accidents as well. But this is uh, the typical kind of uh, concussions that we see uh, happening in the world of sports. So what I wanna point out here is you see the impact. And mm -hmm. what is imp uh, important to notice is that there is no frank loss of consciousness. So the person is in an altered state of consciousness. As you can see, the athlete is, is uh, shaky, but he's moving. Uh, so he's not out completely. But uh, nevertheless, there is definitely a concussion there. Hmm. So here you, you, you have an example of what's probably happening in the, in, in the skull when, uh, when there is an impact of that sort. Uh, the, the brain is shaken and, uh, and hits the, the, the sides of the skull as well as the bottom that has a, a corrugated surface that is rough and that probably uh, 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 grinds against the brain and, and damages it. So here's a, another example of, of what's happening here. Here there were sensors inside the inside the the uh, the, 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 the um, helmet, so the 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 the, uh, the impact was was uh, recorded, and you can see the the brain shaking and uh, and all of its uh, uh, all of its parts are shaking in fact. So this is uh, probably what is happening is the damage happens a lot uh, in, in, uh, in between uh, the hemispheres and then propagates in the rest of the brain. I think we, we can uh, stop uh, there and mm -hmm. go to, to, the, uh, to the talk itself. Let's see. Um, can you see the slides now? Um
Okay, so this is a, a, a simple plug for for a, a book that we, that uh, Isabel Gagnon and I uh, edited a year and a half ago. So I suggest you look it up. Um, uh, um, there were uh, uh, several uh, authors that are well known internationally and recognized internationally, and you'll get a nice uh, a nice overlook of. of of concussions in, in the sports world and, and the treatment and, and how to manage. So there are, there are two types of, of uh, concussions when we talk of, 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 of uh, concussions and the kind of damage that can happen. One is the direct impact uh, that stops uh, uh, the head and then the, 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 there is a movement inside the skull where the frontal lobe is, is, can be affected, but as well as the occipital lobe because there is a, a a movement from one the front to the back, um, and then uh, sorry, and then there are rotational forces like in boxing where the, the head in fact spins uh, this way, and there is a rotation there, and we can get more damage in in, in uh, the brainstem and the lower lower parts of the brain. Uh, let me tell you about some uh, incidence rates. When we talk about head, tra head trauma, we're talking about up to 600 cases per 100,000 in the population. Now, this may seem like, well, it's not that much, but when we look at other very well-known diseases such as Parkinson's, we're talking about 20 per 100,000, um, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, three per 100,000, et cetera. So when, we're, when we see 600 per 100,000, it's of epidemic proportions. So there's a lot of work to be done on uh, concussions and, and traumatic brain injury. In general, 80 to 90% of, of uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries are mild, and then the rest are either moderate or severe. So we're talking about a huge uh, number of mild cases. And mild is a misnomer because mild doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, something that impacts one's life uh, significantly. So one can have a, a mild traumatic brain injury and be really uh, affected in, in everyday function. The causes, the primary cause, causes are uh, uh, both in the USA and, and Canada, are motor vehicle accidents. Also falls are, are very common causes of, of, of traumatic brain injury. And then uh, there are ass, uh, assaults, sports, and uh, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's important to note that um, uh, in sports, the, the, in general, the athletes will uh, uh, fake uh, uh, good, meaning that they'll tell you that they're doing very well, that they're okay, et cetera, because they want to keep on doing what they love to do. Uh, in motor vehicle accident victims or, or uh, falls where there are potential litigation, then the symptoms seem to linger much longer. And uh, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, there is a, we can look at the head injury classification if you like. So you can put, put it on, on, a, on, a, on a continuum going from concussion to mild uh, uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury, moderate and severe. And here it's based on the Glasgow Coma Scale Score. The Glasgow Coma Scale Score is what you see on the bottom here. And uh, it, it, uh, it's a series of questions uh, that, that the professional looks at, uh, usually in the emergency room or, or uh, on the site of impact. And uh, depending on the number of responses, they get a score out of 15. In the case of mild head injury, we're talking about a Glasgow Coma Scale Score ranging from 13 to 15 out of 15, uh, the uh, loss of consciousness that is less than 20 minutes. And that, you know, there are no obvious uh, uh, neurological signs. And the hospitalization, if any, is less than 48 hours. In the case of, of concussions, we're not talking about a, a loss of consciousness, but we're talking about an alteration in mental status or very brief impairment in awareness rather than a true lapse of consciousness. The misconceptions that we often see about t t uh, traumatic, mild traumatic brain injury 
is, is that the symptoms are transient and uh, they are self-resolving and everything will come into order uh, 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 at some point. In fact, uh, uh, about 15 to 20 percent of people uh, uh, have uh, symptoms that can become chronic. And uh, this is important uh, to, to keep in mind. So um, it's important to realize that uh, symptoms may take time uh, to evolve and, and may uh, be there for a long time. Uh, brain injury is always associated with loss of consciousness. That's not true because we can see that uh, brain injury can occur without a loss of consciousness. And this is also important because uh, insurance company used to consider that uh, if a person didn't lose consciousness, then they were okay and, uh, and the, 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 uh, the impact was not that severe. And uh, this is definitely not the case any longer. We don't believe that uh, somebody who hasn't lost consciousness uh, didn't have something significant happening to their brain. The symptoms that we observe uh, 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 immediately following uh, uh, an impact is a temporary confusion and disorientation, uh, amnesia of the event, headaches, nausea, vomiting. We can see some of these or all of these. And then uh, the, the later, the symptoms that persist can be divided into three kinds, somatic. So here we're talking about headaches, dizziness, vertigo, fatigue, insomnia. So again, there can be all of these or some of these. And then there's mood, uh, uh, anxiety, depression, irritability. So after a, a, a traumatic brain injury, this is definitely something to look at, the mood aspect. And then, of course, there are cognitive deficits, so slower thinking, poor attention and concentration, and impaired memory. So after a, a, a traumatic brain injury, a brain injury, ideally, you want to test for these things, mood and uh, uh, neuropsychologically, uh, how is the person functioning? And, and um, so, so the picture that we see of, of patients that have had a traumatic brain injury or a concussion and that have uh, uh, persistent uh, symptoms is that the, 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 uh, no, there is a normal neurological exam. The conventional imaging like CT and MRI are normal and there's no obvious cognitive deficits. Uh, but yet the, the subject is, uh, is talking and presenting and complaining of symptoms. So we used, it used to be thought that uh, the, the symptoms, after, this kind of symptoms after a, 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 a TBI have no apparent organic basis. And this is that the symptoms are simply a psychological reaction uh, to, uh, to the trauma. And uh, this is what I've spent uh, my, my career, most of my career is to, to demonstrate that in fact, this is not true and that there is uh, damage happening at the level of the brain and that you have to make sure that the brain is healed uh, or is healing. So what is the, uh, the pathology? Usually what we find is that uh, the, there is a diffuse axonal injury. So there is a widespread damage to, axon, to axons in the white matter of, of the brain. So, and these are microscopic and um, they're common, commonly see after a severe head injury, but uh, it's not obvious uh, with the conventional means that we have today that uh, uh, diffuse axonal injury is happening. But we know that in fact it is happening because of autopsy cases that had a, mild trauma, a history of mild traumatic brain injury and that, that show uh, diffuse axonal injury. And of course, uh, uh, the reason uh, that we don't see it is that the white matter changes are not easily detectable by the conventional MRI machines that we have today. So what, well, this drawing here shows that you may get a hit uh, over here and have damage in the deep structures of the brain over here. So in, for instance, in the case of, uh, of uh, Parkinson's disease, we know that, that there may be uh, uh, dysfunctions or damage in, in the deep structures of the brain and uh, that an impact may make worse, the symptoms worse. So there is the notion of coup and contre-coup. So there is a hit over here and more damage on the other side because the brain has shifted and hit the other side of, of the skull. 
And here, this is what I was showing before, the, the, uh, uh, an impact here that causes damage in deep structures of the brain. So when we look a little bit uh, deep, more deeply into, into the brain and we look at a single axon, what may be happening is tearing of the axon. And so there is a tearing that is not easily detectable by conventional imaging. And the person uh, may be complaining of symptoms. And yet when we do a normal, uh, a, a, a conventional MRI, everything comes out normal. And yet the patient, the subject is complaining of symptoms and, and, and because of probably of these tears. This is more, uh, uh, this is another example of this. So there is a, nor here is a normal axon. There is, here is an example of a shearing of an, an axon. So there's a, a torsion and then the, the axon is, is uh, ripped or, or twisted and tears. And then there is uh, also, uh, uh, then the, there is a death of, of that axon. Now, if somebody has damage uh, here, uh, an athlete has uh, this type of damage and does not wait to, uh, before there is healing, then they're more vulnerable to more damage. So that's why it's really important that after a concussion, that the person be sure that they're no longer symptomatic. Otherwise, it, 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 their, their brain is still fragile and vulnerable. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about this, only to show that when there is a, a here is a normal uh, brain activity uh, here. And then when there's an impact, what, what we see here, for example, is a demand in glucose. So, the, the, so the, the, there is a drop here and it may vary, the, the, the coming back to an equilibrium may vary from one individual to another. So it may take more time for one individual for the system to come back into balance than for another. And that's why we see so many individual differences uh, between people that have had concussions. Some recuperate, uh, you know, right away and others, uh, the symptoms linger and linger. Now, what's happening with, with uh, dementia? Uh, we've, we've been looking at chronic traumatic encephalopathy and we've been trying to get funds to be looking at that aspect because it, it's so important, uh, um, this aspect uh, of, uh, there's a hypothesis that repeated concussions or subconcussive concussive impacts cause CTE, but this, this is not proven. Uh, what, what there seems to be is a cumulative effect of, of hits. So if you don't wait between uh, uh, hits and the brain is still fragile, then there is a cumulative effect that can uh, uh, trigger uh, um, uh, CTE later on in life or early degenerative disease early on in life. And, and this we've seen in several sports. So let me give you some examples. Uh, CTE was first observed in 1920 in professional boxers, and it used to be called the punch drunk syndrome uh, or dementia pugilistica. Uh, so, and the symptoms develop progressively over decades uh, and, and probably 12 to 16 years or more uh, uh, after uh, uh, later on. So in 2008, the, 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 uh, the, the, the BU School of Medicine started the, the brain bank. And, and, um, and it was based on the extent of the tau deposits that are seen in the brain. And of course, there's no, uh, no history that exists. Uh, in the sports, there has been growing awareness. So the prevalence in the National Football League, the prevalence rate of CTE is about 3.7%. That's not much, but for a single individual, it's significant. So in 2012, there was... Uh, uh, um, 4,000 former NFL players that joined the civil suit and the NFL eventually reached a $765 million uh, settlement. Um, in 2015, four NFL players under age 30 retired early with, con uh, with uh, concussions. And the youngest was Chris Borden, a 25 year old who retired early uh, because he didn't want to be uh, suffering from CTE later on. And in 2011, I don't know if everybody remembers, but there were three, three uh, uh, players that committed suicide in the NHL. And all of them 
were uh, what we call enforcers. So they, they were uh, fighters and uh, probably sustained uh, numerous uh, uh, concussions. And, uh, and so when they, their brains were analyzed after their death, uh, they had they had do, they had made sure to donate their brains uh, before they committed suicide, and uh, and all of them had CTE. So the symptoms of, of uh, CTE are mood disorders. So we see depression, confusion, anxiety, and suicidal behavior, and there are cognitive impairments. So there's a, a progressive uh, dementia and memory loss. And there are also behavioral changes, such as aggressivity, impulsivity, uh, explosive behavior. And uh, there are uh, also motor disturbances, such as abnormal gait or tremors. And uh, of note, uh, all these symptoms are also typical of other uh, neurogenerative di diseases. So there's definitely an overlap there happening. So the, uh, do you, I don't know if you remember the case of Chris Benoit, who was a, uh, a world uh, wrestling champion. And um, uh, just on the weekend that he was supposed to, uh, to uh, defend his, uh, his uh, third uh, championship, he, uh, he instead uh, killed his wife and st strangled his, his son to death and then hung himself using cords from the weight machine. And the medical examiners concluded that uh, the elevated uh, testosterone levels in Benoit's body um, uh, did not contribute to his violence. The possible cause was repetitive head injuries that he sustained uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in his sport and that resulted in CTE. And, and when, when, uh, when they looked at, uh, at his brain, you could see that there were neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, and, um, and so here you can see these black uh, dots here uh, that are uh, these uh, uh, cumulative tangles of tau. So um, uh, there was another study that showed in fact that of, uh, of 2,500 former NFL players uh, at UNC that cognitive impairment, dementia and depression rose proportionately with the number of concussions the, the subject had sustained. So those who sustained three or more concussions were more likely to experience significant memory problems and five times more likely to develop mild cognitive impairment. So the more concussions you have in your life, the greater the likelihood you may have a, at least mild cognitive impairment later on in life. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, again, it shows the impact that can happen and the movement of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the brain inside the skull. So along with other damage, one result is that a nerve cell protein called beta amyloid precursor protein is cut into pieces called beta amyloid plaques. And over time, neurofibrillary tangles containing tau protein fibers accumulate. So we'll show you examples of that. So a CTE uh, first uh, is very difficult to, to, uh, uh, to identify and to diagnose. And we definitely need to do more research in that aspect. We would like to do a PET scanning on, on, on players that have, uh, that have had multiple concussions and compare them to players such as uh, uh, um, the kicker in football who uh, uh, played a lot of games but did not necessarily get a lot of concussions compared to other positions. And we would like to do PET studies on those and see if we can uh, detect those, those, uh, those uh, tau protein tangles. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, to uh, have funds to be able to, it's an expensive endeavor, but uh, certainly it's much needed. So, um, so here is the kind of thing that, that is seen under the microscope. Uh, chronic, so CTE is marked by concentrations of tau proteins shown here as brown spots. You can see here. So this is uh, on the left, a normal 65 year old brain. And then the, the, this is the brain of former NFL linebacker, John Grimsley, who died of a, a gunshot wound at age 45 after nine documented concussions. 
my hunch is probably that he probably had more than that. So uh, here you can see uh, by comparing the two, uh, the, the, the definite abnormal uh, uh, tau uh, protein uh, accumulation there. Uh, so, um, uh, Anne McKee is the person that did uh, all the CTE studies in, in Boston. And what may be uh, happening uh, here is if you look at the, at, at the cell and the transport system of, of, of the messages, if you like, uh, the cell's transport system is made up of microtubules that you see here, which are held together by tau proteins. So the repeated blows to the head cause the tau to modify and detach from the tubules, the microtubules, which fall apart. So the microtubules fall apart, the tau proteins are left there, and then they begin uh, to combine and form tangles, ultimately killing the cell. So this is what we see uh, uh, with, the tau, uh, with the tau proteins. And hopefully with, uh, with uh, 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 positron emission tomography, we would be able to identify these and, and act early and try to, to help uh, before the degeneration becomes uh, uh, irreversible. So this is what CTE looks like again. So this is the uh, normal 65 year old. This is a former linebacker, John Grimsley, who died at age 45. And this is a 73 year old boxing champion, champion with severe dementia. So this one looks even worse. And you see the tau here, it's much darker, meaning that there's more accumulation there. So if we were able to, to do this, uh, uh, to identify this uh, before the person dies, it uh, would be nice, you know. Uh, here, that's the, it's the only way at this point to be able to, make, to be sure with the diagnosis. So uh, uh, we did a study at McGill. How much time do I have? Um, you have about ten minutes, and I was hoping that we could talk about also just like uh, how do you how do you take care of yourself once you've had a concussion? So let me answer that. Uh, the way to 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 uh, take care of yourself. Uh, when you, it used to be, uh, we used to think that uh, the way to take care of yourself when you have a concussion is to close yourself up in a dark room and not do anything for uh, X amount of time. Uh, today, this is different. It's not quite the same. Uh, today, the, the, the consensus is that the person uh, can do, um, can be active and should try to be active, but should stop as soon as this, there is a recurrence of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if the person feels ready or has rested and feels that the symptoms have improved and they're doing okay, then they should make a, try to return gradually to activity and, and take a step back approach. So if you're, doing, uh, if you're doing well, you try to go back. So in sports, uh, for instance, if you're a hockey player, you'll try to start uh, uh, going back to the gym if uh, you exercise and there is no recurrence of symptoms, then you uh, fine. You can increase and and uh, and uh, start skating, for instance, and etc. And, and move up without equipment, then with equipment, etc. So that's the way it's done. So uh, uh, try to remain active. Make take a step back approach if the symptoms recur or become worse. And, and, and then rest and just keep on doing what you're doing as long as the symptoms don't recur. And then gradually increase the, the, uh, what you're doing uh, as long as the symptoms don't come back. Okay. Is, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, did you wanna ask another question? Well, one thing that I found very, um, you know, I had first seen you speak a few years ago and, you know, when you showed the slide about you know, the, the, the more concussions a person suffers at a young age, the higher chances they have of suffering from, um, you know, cognitive issues in the yes. future. So, you know, I always thought that this talk would be very important to, for one to be given to, you know, high school parents, you yeah. know, or children that are athletes. And so what message would you have to parents yeah. whose kids are very, very athletic and who's so, already suffered one or two concussions what message yeah. would you have uh, yes so that's in in uh, in the in the younger in the, in, in the younger uh, in children and in adolescents the brain is still in in development so the brain is vulnerable <clears throat> 
to uh, impact. And not only that, it takes longer <clears throat> to, for, for, uh, for kids to recuperate from uh, a concussion. The same for women. Women uh, um, also are vulnerable to, more vulnerable to concussion than men, it seems, and take, they take longer to recover. This, there, there may be a combination of hormones and a, a different uh, brain organization. Uh, the neck musculature, which is not as strong in children and in, in women as in men, which makes it more vulnerable to, to concussions. So in, 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 in children and in women, we have to be really careful not to return to activity before the symptoms have completely resolved. And I'm not saying that, uh, that children should not do any sports or, or anything like that, but certainly if there is a, 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 a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury, they should ensure that their, their uh, uh, symptoms have completely resolved before they return to play. I think I know the answer to this question, but you know, I think a lot of people want to know once there has been um, damage done to the brain because of concussions, is there any way to restore it to like back to it being normal or perfect again? Yeah, so you know, we uh, uh, our brain is, is uh, plastic in the sense that it's that it has some flexibility. So it, it has to be given time to heal, but at the same time, it, it is capable of reorganizing itself. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you have to give it time, but it will reorganize and you, you will develop compensatory mechanisms that will help you function. So, um, uh, so this is probably one way, is, is, uh, one way to think of it is that the brain reorganizes itself and uh, the other way is to um, uh, do, for instance, uh, if there's cognitive problems, to do cognitive remediation. Mm -hmm. So be active in, uh, in stimulating your brain. And, uh, and that way, there is uh, definitely hope that, that the person can recuperate. And that to make sure that they recovered before going back to whatever they were doing. Um, we still have a few minutes if you want to finish your slides that would be great okay so uh, we did a, a, a study of varsity athletes because we were interested in looking at whether we could uh, uh, there was a relationship between uh, the presence of post-concussive symptoms and the activations we see in, in we see in functional mri functional mri we look at the brain in activity while the person is doing a task so this is different than looking at simply the structure of the brain. If you look at the structure of the brain, it'll be, um, a, a, you know, about 100% of the time it'll be normal. But if you do a functional MRI uh, while the person is doing a task, what you see, what you see is a lack of activation uh, in certain regions of the brain. So when the person is doing a task, it demands more blood. And what the functional MRI uh, does is, is pick up uh, that uh, uh, accrued uh, uh, blood flow uh, in the particular region. Now, in, in those subjects that have symptoms, uh, the, the, uh, this blood flow, this increased blood flow does not happen. So, uh, so let me show you quickly. We submitted to this kind of task here. And uh, what you see when, in normal subjects is, is activations in all these regions, which, which are very nice activations here. And when, uh, let's see, just, uh, whoops. I think I'm going to lose, uh, it says uh, that it's closing the program. I may have well, to understand this. Uh, maybe you can uh, ask me questions and I'll... <laughs> well, we, yeah, well, we only have, um, uh, you know, we only have a few minutes left. Okay. And so... So I can you know, summarize I said, with you what we yeah. find with functional MRI. What we find yeah. is, is that uh, is athletes that are symptomatic, they show a lack, to, a lack of activations in the frontal areas and in the temporal areas. And uh, um, this, these, these symptoms are there. And when the person recuperates, 
we see uh, that the, the, the uh, activation patterns come back to what, we, what they were showing at baseline before they even mm -hmm. uh, sustain the concussion. Mm -hmm. And then those that don't recuperate, when we follow them three months later, and they still have symptoms, we still see this hypo activations, mm -hmm. this lack of activation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the functional MRI is definitely a great uh, diagnostic tool uh, to use mm -hmm. for diagnosing uh, concussions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe because I only have just a couple of minutes left, what, what, what would you consider in addition to your book um, would be some great resources for people to go to? Are there some good websites or good resources yeah, so that they could learn? If you look at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation site, uh, they have a, a new guidelines that are very nice and that you can, uh, you, you can consult and are, are very helpful. And of course, my book, which is, which is, you know, because it, it it goes into treatment, etc. So it's it's interesting. And so, yeah. so the Ontario right. Neurotrauma Foundation site is really good. Well, I'm gonna make sure to share today's webcast with lots of parents watching whose kids are playing sports. Oh, good. And, and um, well, thank you very, very much for joining us today on our My show. Pleasure. It was so inform informative. That video gets me the, every time that you start with. It's very hard to watch and uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Next week, we have a very uh, important topic as well. And it's about navigating the journey of Parkinson's disease. And my guest is Dr. Ronald Postuma, Professor of Neurology at McGill University. Just to remind everyone that this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. I would once again like to thank the Zeller Family Foundation for sponsoring today's episode. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at www.mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you have any questions or topics that you would like us to discuss during our webcast, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Until next week, take good care of yourselves and your loved ones. Thank you for watching.